there and welcome back to another episode of Customers Who Click. Another great episode today and a really interesting topic as today we're going to be talking about selling on Amazon. I know people on both sides of the fence on this. Some insist that selling through Amazon just cannibalizes your business and makes data collection really difficult. And others would argue that it's a really powerful way of acquiring new customers. Where do you sit on this? Tweet me at Will Lawrenson. Uh, Do you shop on Amazon a lot personally? Uh, If you're a D2C brand, do you sell on Amazon or do you avoid it? Personally, while I'm making more and more of an effort to buy directly from brands, I do frequently find it more convenient and, and quite often cheaper to buy from Amazon instead. So if you are selling on Amazon or considering it, how can you make the most of this opportunity and get more than just those individual sales from it? My guest today will talk us through just that. George Barnett Reed, formerly of Amazon, is here to explain how you can make Amazon work for your business. Hi, George. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Could you tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and uh, and what you're doing at the moment? Sure. Thanks for having me, Will. Um, we look forward to a little natter. Um, my background was I started my Amazon experience working at Amazon in the UK on a three P side of the business left set up a amazon consultancy and then have now merged from education which i was in for a while now into more the amazon advertising space and looking to support people with that but largely just looking to share as much valuable content about the amazon world as possible i'm on on george's dot blog and that's kind of where we're at mate cool sounds good so what, what did you do at amazon so my role at Amazon was, they wouldn't define it as this, but it was essentially sales and account management. I transitioned from the FBA team to the Seller Prime team to the Amazon business team and, and Pan EU. And our role was centered around KPIs such as selection um, for FBA or um, number of new accounts on FBA. Um, and then once you brought those accounts on board, you were then looking at revenue. Um, with the Amazon business team, slightly different, launching that business as cool. So we had a lot of KPIs again, but then there was a bit more, I guess, top of funnel stuff and awareness stuff, you could say, with trade shows, et cetera. But an array of different roles there on the merchant side of the business. All right, cool. So, yeah, let's talk about um, like actually selling on Amazon a bit then. Can you give us a general intro to to what that looks like for, for a brand and maybe um, – It'd be good to talk about why brands should sell on Amazon um, and also maybe some of the downsides to it and and, uh, why you want to make sure you've obviously got your own website and and selling direct. Yeah, good point. Um, So with a lot of what I'm doing now, it's not as much focused on why people should be selling on Amazon. It's becoming more of a given that the the sheer volume of traffic and transactions that are happening on Amazon, how much it's used as the the first place to start your journey as a customer with your search, it's logical to be putting your products on a platform where you can get such large visibility. Um, So a lot of people are viewing it as almost an acquisition channel as well as um, a major part of their business. The logical piece to do, in my opinion, is never become over-reliant on one channel. So Amazon is fantastic, but people can get shafted when they put all their eggs in one basket. They're not building out a presence on their own website. They're not building out presence on other marketplaces. They're not looking at what's coming around the corner with regards to, I don't know, like Facebook shops, for instance, um, but yeah, Amazon is it's a phenomenal platform because I think like 30 to 40% of e-commerce in the UK is done in it. It's about 40, 45% in the US, such a large volume of transactions and people are going to that platform. It makes sense for you to have a presence there. Um, if you don't have a presence there, then it's also then that risk that distributors will have a presence and they will misrepresent your brand which can then come back to bite you um, down the line. And that's been happened. I've seen multiple cases of that happening um, over the past few years um, working in this space. So it's not just a case of, oh, we don't want to go there because our margins are going to be trimmed down. We're going to ignore it. It's a case of if you don't, perhaps someone else will, unless you've got very good tight contracts with your distributors. Um, Again, it's, it's someone where you want a presence, but it's a friend and foe in some capacity. Yeah, it makes sense really. Um actually had a we had a conversation on the podcast um oh god knows how long ago, 40 episodes ago, um, about 
uh, kind of the idea was dominating page one of Google, um, but not not from a strictly SEO point of view, but more from that point of view of, uh, you know, if, if someone's going to be searching for your product and Amazon is going to be on page one, then don't try and compete with Amazon. Get on that Amazon page. Make sure you are that listing that Amazon is actually uh, ranking for. Um, so I suppose like from, from that point of view, it's a similar thing, really. You're not, not necessarily using it as, as your, your main sales channel. It's just uh, there's an opportunity there to, to get eyes on your products um, and maybe acquire some customers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's traffic, it's brand awareness, it's, uh, you know, the conversion rate on Amazon is much higher than your own website. Customers have already got all their information plugged in. They've got guaranteed next day delivery, sometimes, you know, four hour delivery with Prime now in, in London and other big cities. So people have that trust there as well. So that's what's driving the conversion rate up if you're dragging them onto your website perhaps they haven't got their card handy perhaps they don't trust something about your website maybe it is a a pixelated logo of paypal which puts them off or maybe it's them having to add their delivery address which is too much ball ache because the cookies have been deleted recently and all of their information is wiped out about their home address all of these things are driving down conversion rate amazon obviously solves that problem by making it frictionless that's why they've got that um, kind of impulse um, buy opportunities on their site. I like the one-click buying. It's what they're looking to achieve. Again, with things like Kindle, their goal was to try and get a book in someone's hands within 60 seconds. They're trying to make that as frictionless as possible. Now, if you can obviously convert those customers quicker, that's great because you're bringing them into your ecosystem uh, and you bring in more of them into your ecosystem because your conversion rates are higher. So it's not just a case of having a presence on Amazon. It's what what it can do for your for your overall business as well. So, you know, lots of people talk about the stats around Amazon advertising, which is we can come on to if you like, you know, an incredibly competitive marketplace now. Um, but a lot of people, I think like 70 to 80% of people surveyed by Feedvisor a year ago were saying that they're using that pay-per-click model on Amazon to acquire customers. And that's one of the largest reasons they're using it. Um, I think it would be, again, if you surveyed people around why you're actually using Amazon, a lot of it is acquisition as well as um, as well as well awareness. If people are able to go onto Amazon, check the reviews, perhaps they feel more comfortable coming onto your own website and buying directly because you've got those reviews on Amazon, they can see that you're a real brand. So yeah, it's um, coming back to the question of, yes, you want a presence there, um, it's going to validate, but also it's going to it's going to act as a, a source of income and a source of traffic. There's obviously some, I guess, fairly dodgy tactics that people use on Amazon. I think the main one that I've come across recently is uh, basically the ability to take over a store page and change the content. So change the product that's actually being sold there, but you've got that history on the page. I guess it's it's a bit of a misleading tactic to use. But why do you think that's not something Amazon have kind of cracked down on? You're probably referring more to Amazon listings where um, third-party sellers, there could be more than one on a particular listing. Um, and what typically used to happen at Amazon, there was a contribution score of sort. So whoever um, had done the most sales in a certain period of time, that would drive up their contribution score for that listing, which enabled them to make certain changes. It may not be the exact case now, but Back in the day when we were there, people maybe had more contribution towards being able to change the images than changing some of the text. Um, obviously, different merchants, if they're selling the same product, have different reasons for wanting to change some of that content. So in one example I saw with, with a brand called Licky Mat I worked with a while ago, their distributor was slowly looking to change that listing to remove the term brand name Licky Mat out of it and slowly include their own brand name inside of it. And that was happening over a period of time in order to essentially go, well, you've got loads of good reviews on this listing and loads of sales and loads and loads of ongoing traffic to this listing. If we can now get our brand in there somehow, that's great for our brand awareness play and it can help us catapult our other range. 
So there's a number of different reasons why you do it. For those listening, though, I mean, the you don't really want to be left in this situation because this situation is when you're selling your branded products on Amazon, which is the only kind of route I'd go. Um, and you're competing with your distributors who are also selling your branded products. And this happens more often than it should, where you've got your distributors and you selling against each other. And this largely comes down to just about poor communication, really. No one benefits apart from the customer because you're just battling with each other on price. Yeah. But it makes no sense because the distributor is never going to have as good a price. So this is why you need to take a step back and have these conversations with the distributors to go, listen, we're on Amazon now. It's not going to work for us both to sell there. Um, so maybe giving them the option to go, we, we can buy some of the stock back if this is an issue for you because we've come into this channel or um, we're able to give you some support um, offloading it uh, on other channels and doing promotions there if you don't want to sell it anymore. But essentially, it doesn't benefit any party for you to be competing. What may happen is if you're both distributors and um, the brand owner isn't on Amazon and you're just battling each other, looking to change the titles and things like that, that can be a little bit messier. Um, but there's no kind of brilliant solution there. I don't, I don't really play too much in the distributor world. Um, the other than thought process around this is when people struggle to change some of their content, brand owners are coming in and trying to change their content, but they're struggling. Happens a lot more on the vendor side, I've noticed. Um, and this can just be a case of like taking ownership of that brand. And that's where brand registry comes into play a little bit, where you're essentially kind of putting your stamp on a brand on the platform. Usually happens when distributors have sold it first, historically from 10 years ago. The brand then comes on, but they haven't kind of put their stamp on it through brand registry and said that we own this content. We are the producer of this product. This barcode belongs to us, and therefore we have the most accurate information. Um, brand registry helps, and then obviously working with seller and vendor support to get those changes through, but it can always be a bit of ball lake, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it just made me, uh, when it comes to the, like, the content and stuff, I um I've noticed on a on some listings you get kind of super detailed almost like landing pages. Yeah. Um, do you know is there is that something a, a brand has to kind of earn or pay for to get or is it is it just a case of spending more time building out that actual listing page? No. So what you're referring to is A plus content. It was formerly known as enhanced branded content when when we were back at Amazon. And traditionally, when we were there, you, you it was limited. It was incredibly limited. Now, it's fully accessible to those who have gone through brand registry. Um, obviously, you need to have a trademark for your brand in order to be able to go through brand registry. There is some kind of process in place now where if you've submitted your trademark during that two, three-month waiting period, you can let Amazon know that it's there for submission and get earlier, earlier access but essentially, this is, like you said, a landing page beneath the bullet points um, and beneath some of the sponsored product placements that sit there at the moment. And it gives you as your brand the opportunity to, I guess, put richer content into your listing. The issue is we're seeing a lot of shit content here where brands aren't utilizing those placements well enough. So they're not quite sure what to do. They haven't really thought too much about their strategy for this. And they're seeing it as an opportunity just to put more text in and get more keywords in. But a lot of studies have shown that you're not getting any ranking impact from having keywords at that point. The algorithm isn't actually looking at the keywords there. Google looks at it, but Amazon doesn't necessarily. All it really is is an opportunity for you to showcase more of your brand um, and more of your brand story. So, the clever people, what they do is ignore most of the placements available to you, which Amazon encourage. They just focus on those big landscape image templates that they're given. And what they do is off of Amazon, their design team, and you know we work with the design team to do this, and we share loads of examples in the Amazon Creators Facebook group of how this can be done well. But essentially, the design team mock up like an A4 page and they break it down into five segments or six segments, I believe, you can have. And 
they create it as if it's one big um, portrait picture and they're putting everything on it. So it could be the brand story, it could be infographics, it could be how to use, it could be cross-sell, um, it could be anything. And again, I need examples to show you, but the creators group is there for that. And then what they're doing is they're slicing it up into the, the measurements that Amazon are asking for within those images, and they're uploading it onto Amazon A+. When the user then sees it, those segments come together and it's much more rich, much more engaging. It's a pattern interrupt, which is a term I've robbed from Andrew Shields, who said it on my podcast a while ago, um, which I really like. So amongst that white and text you've got, you've then suddenly got a big, bold colors, which talk about your brand. So a really nice pattern interrupt. And it also is on its way down to the reviews. So anyone scrolling down the page, the reviews are then hit with some really engaging and rich content as well, which kind of um, takes them further along that funnel towards the um, red hot buyer position that they want to convert on the way down to reading those reviews. But yeah, A plus content is the summary there. Yeah, yeah, I've seen some really good examples of it. Um, and it makes a massive difference, doesn't it? When you scroll through one one listing and it's basically just the text, um, product description, product details, um, sometimes a bit of a comparison. Does the, is the comparison uh, a brand thing? Can you, you Can you only compare with other products that you own or is it a kind of an Amazon thing which will say, here are some other products? No, so above and below the fold in that case, um, you're going to have Amazon sponsored recommendations, which people are bidding on. When people are bidding on your listing, they're essentially saying, we want to place an ad on this person's ASIN, this SKU of theirs. But within that box that you're looking inside of the A+, you have the opportunity to display anything from three to five, I believe, other products of yours to encourage that cross-sell. So let's take coffee, for example. Perhaps you've, you're have you on a listing, which is your strongest coffee, the kind of four-shot bad boy, which is rocket fuel for your morning workout. But then people who have landed on it perhaps aren't too interested in it because of how you've sold it. They want something a little bit easier on the on the palate and easier on the um, the, the body. And at the bottom, then you kind of go, well, here is our stages of different levels of coffee and strength, right the way from the caffeinated up to um, the turbocharged one. So they can go, I love the brand. I'm connected with the brand. I like how it's made. I like the background. I like the brand story. I love everything about it. But the strength isn't right for me. What else do you have? And you're giving them, them options which is great because you're then directing the traffic back to another page of your own rather than letting that customer go back to the search journey. Another one I've seen, which is really cool for this and clever, was a vitamin brand did it. One of those placements, those big images, they simulated the Amazon search bar. And inside of that search bar, they put um, their brand name and then they put um, vitamin D. And I think it was a vitamin C serum or something they had but they put vitamin D. So if you're looking for vitamin D as well, you're telling them how they can go find your vitamin D by putting the brand name and then putting a vitamin D. So they're getting the search term in there if that customer um, kind of goes through that process. So they're looking for your brand and you're going to get really good ranking from that. So was that just a, a static image, but it was yeah. an, image, an image of the search bar pre-filled with uh, brand name vitamin D. So you... So as you're reading it, you would go, oh, yeah, that is all I have to do. I've literally just got yeah. to type in brand name vitamin D. Yeah, maybe yeah, they're going, you know what? I'm on, um, I can see like this product, it was collagen, I think. I really like it. But I'm also, you know, I was going to look for vitamin D afterwards as well. But I can see these guys have it. So I'll add this one to basket. I'll go to the search and I'll search vitamin D by these guys. What's genius about it is it's a massive search term, probably a primary search term for them. And the customer's going there hot, looking to buy them all organically, really, because it's a search, find, buy process, but they're searching it, finding it, and then hopefully buy it. Yeah. Do, uh, do, they, do you remember if they include the image of the product as well in that, yeah, in that search? Yeah. 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 So yeah. You, you're saying this is what you need to search for, and this is, by the way, is what it looks like. So look out for this image when you're, when you're browsing the listings. 
hundred percent. So they know exactly what to look for, click on it, and it's usually a quicker conversion, which is great for the algorithm as well. Yeah, that's that is really clever. Yeah, I like that. But you you kind of talked a bit about acquisition at the start and how um, yeah brands can use it as an acquisition channel. What what are some of the best ways for actually capturing those customers post post purchase? I mean, my my understanding is that you as a merchant you don't get much. Well, you don't get any customer data from Amazon. Um, <laughs> which kind of makes sense because why would Amazon want to do that? Um, so yeah, as a brand, how can you, how can you actually try and capture those customers um, and, and bring them into your brand? Yeah, it's, it's obviously a challenging point with Amazon, which people obviously dislike. Um, but the first and foremost things you've got to do is essentially build a, build a brilliant product from scratch. Like if you've got a shit product, they're never going to engage with you again anyway. So that's part and parcel, right? If it's a bad product, it's not going to work. You haven't acquired anyone. If you've got a genuinely exceptional product, that's always put you on the front foot. For me, you then need to look at your physical touch points you've got with that customer. So the first one, obviously, is that that box and, and the unboxing experience. And I've talked a lot about this in the past. So if they are fully aware of that box, which is going to be delivered on their doorstep and they're already expecting your box because maybe it was one of your main images. That starts the, uh, I call it invoking an emotion, that starts that kind of emotional journey with you when they see it as opposed to it being in an Amazon box. So if you kind of ship in your own container um, and it's ready to be sent straight out, they have the opportunity to then see your box a company like Away Travel do this quite well. They have these nice big blue boxes which have Away on the side. So as soon as I saw that when I bought one recently, I was like, fuck, this looks great. I know exactly what it is. As opposed to getting delivered in an Amazon box, I'm like, okay, it could be anything. Uh, particularly if you're like my mother who buys an obscene amount of stuff there. So you're starting that journey with them immediately and you're building that experience with them. Then so it comes just, to- just to touch on that uh, a bit, because ev- everything I order comes in an Amazon box. So is it a is it like an option thing? Is it to do with fulfillment or something? If yeah, yeah, you sometimes have the option to work. ship in your own container, S I O C, um, where essentially you'll you'll be able to send those products out in its in its own box to save Amazon and using that packaging. It doesn't happen as often as you'd like, but it's slowly creeping in more and more, yep. um, where it's going out in its own box. Obviously, reduces cardboard as well. So thumbs up there. Um, and Amazon obviously rewarding people for this as well with some climate friendly pledges, um, et cetera, as well. I've seen a bit of these placements on product detail pages or listings, as some people say, which say this product is kind of climate friendly. Um, so it's becoming more and more common. It's um, not not used heavily, which is why you're, you're perhaps less likely to have seen it. And it's not across like, the full range, obviously, with very small products. It doesn't always happen. Um, but yeah, if we then go on to kind of unboxing experience, we then need to think about what we can do with that outer box to immediately get them to do something. So a brand like Who Gives a Crap do very good with this. They're already invoking an emotion by showcasing more of their brand there um, all over the side of the box. They then can do things like, let's say, QR code. So again, if it's a nice box, people keep it. For whatever reason, we kept that who gives a crap box for far too long. I think we were storing toilet roll in it. But as a result, I saw it every time I walked in the door because it was on top of this particular cupboard. So every day I'd walk in the door and see this nice box. You're less likely to throw it away because it's nice. Um, If you then got a call to action on that box, which could be it wouldn't work with a demo with toilet paper, but let's yeah. say it was a demo with something else, kind of like um, it's a blender you had got and it goes, here's three brilliant smoothies you can make in X, Y, Z seconds, or here's a cocktail you can make um, in under three minutes, step-by-step step, scan the code here, or with Dyson, activate your warranty or a- extend your warranty here. Yeah, All of these things are on the outside of the box, looking to pull that customer somewhere so you can, A, offer them more value, like straight up offer them value, and B, look to collect some information, to collect some touch points. That's just on the outside of the box. That's that's probably what I see the most, um, extended warranties. So register to get 
uh, an extended five-year warranty or something. And yeah, it is. It's literally just a. It's for data capture, um, which which is fine. But uh, I, I think brands could do a lot more with that. Um, because partly because, uh, as far as I'm aware, if I registered for for an extended warranty, that wouldn't necessarily give you mark uh, the right to market to me. So I still there yeah. still needs to be that extra touch point to say. Obviously, if they're ticking the box, it would. Are you happy uh, yeah. for us to share? If you specifically opt into it, but um, but yeah, there's much more you can do. So, like for me, I think the insert offers more of an opportunity here. The product insert inside, they're still massively overlooked. So a lot of them are shit. But again, like away travel, they did a great job. They had a really nice insert on good weighted card. I use it as a bookmark for a few months until I eventually lost it. But essentially every day, because it was a nice insert, I call it like a fridge-worthy insert. Would you put it on the fridge and not know why? Would your girlfriend bizarrely just keep it? And would it be able to explain to someone why she's keeping it other than the fact that she likes it? You know, like we've all got got those people in our lives who collect bizarre things like that. And again, I'm the same. Like I'll make a good bookmark. I don't want to throw it away. It looks nice. Your insert should play that role. And then on that insert, you can obviously call them to other different things. So like I use communities quite a lot at the moment. Wild VIP do a phenomenal job with this. The brothers set up a company recently called Merwave, um, uh, which which has got a phenomenal, one of the best communities I've seen to date. And I would never kind of um, blow smoke up his ass. Like it's genuinely really, really good because they're inviting people continuously to join that community and there's so much engagement. They're seeing about eight to 10 posts a day of people sharing their wavy hair pictures and everyone piling in. If you incentivize that with um, whatever you want, obviously you can get a bit gray here, join the community to get X off. That can be a little bit gray, um, but what you can be doing is kind of join the community for ongoing discounts and to be part of our um, kind of customer research team so we develop products around you phrase it however you want but i think the community offers so much value now and you can put whatever catchy sentence you want to get them there um and it's again obviously a community isn't an email isn't building that email list but it's one step closer and again visibility on these communities are much higher than liking someone on facebook like i don't really see the point of that because it's yep. what like sub five percent for a Facebook post, whereas in my creators group we often see fifty to eighty percent of members viewing the content, which you would never get on an Instagram feed. So I massively encourage these groups now. Um, I think people should be thinking outside the box a bit more. I'm intrigued by. I really want some brand to use like a Slack channel or something like that and customize it in some way maybe segment up their customers in Slack channels so you kind of have that immediate communication and it's still community vibe unlike an email list. Um, And it's got a bit more curation to it than um, a Facebook group. But these are all things you can do within that unboxing experience. And that is your key component to bring someone into your ecosystem. Um, And it could be, you know, a good one if it's a subscribing product or a consumable product is join the subscription here um, and pay X for Y, et cetera. But then it starts to get a little bit gray. Uh, what, in terms of Amazon saying, no, you can't do that? or Yeah. I mean, if you're going, you've paid 30 quid for one item, um, come join our subscription where it's 45 for two. Um, that, again, is looking to pull people off of Amazon to make a sale. They're not liking it. Um, yeah. So you need to be a little bit cautious here, um, although it's lower risk. Um, it's not like how abusive some of the Chinese sellers are being with some of these policies, which is why a large uh, group of them got deleted from Amazon as a whole recently in the tech space, but that was linking it back to reviews. Um, so there's one thing pulling them onto your own platform but there's another pulling them back to amazon to incentivize a positive review that's kind of a red card in comparison to what may be deemed a yellow all right okay uh oh sorry yeah to, to leave a 
like a five star review. So incentivize specifically a five star to me, or just any review. Yeah, exactly, mate. Like the yeah. the numbers are outrageous um, yeah. with with what was happening recently. That I think two or three of the biggest sellers has wiped off. Um, who was selling? I've actually got the data in front of me. Yeah, M Power and Orki. There were two big Chinese sellers who were removed. Um, the total suspended sales eclipsed a billion um, just oh, wow. from suspending over a dozen Chinese sellers. Um, so like, it was a big kind of slap, but that was more due to these random, basically not really real companies creating tech products and heavily incentivizing yeah. fake reviews. So, well, I mean, I, I suppose, yeah, the situation there is you've got some people who are trying to take customers away and others go, we don't really like that, but we know that's what you want to do ideally as a brand. And then the other one is kind of, it's putting Amazon at risk because if they're incentivizing five-star reviews and those products aren't good, that, that looks bad for Amazon, not necessarily the merchant. Absolutely, mate. Yeah. It's it's just shit customer experience. And that comes back to leadership principle. Number one, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I've definitely, I have seen those actually. Um, I've seen one or two where I was incentivized to leave a review. Um, it wasn't, it, it's it's not specified five star or anything like that, but uh, you would, I think you got a 10 pound, might've been a 10 pound Amazon voucher if you left a review and sent them a screenshot of it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I just, I wonder if, if I'd left them maybe a three star or worse or maybe just anything other than a five star whether they a wouldn't have given me the 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 gift card or b would have at least tried to work with me first to try and bump that up that was a common a common strategy was they would send you something like many chat let's say and they would ask for you for a review on many chat first of do you rate it kind of one to five star yeah. if you went four or five they would then link you back to Amazon to go leave that positive review. If you put one to three, they would then open up a communication with something that wasn't a bot in order to look to solve that problem of yours. And yeah. then if you were satisfied, look to send you back to Amazon. It's so, yeah. is that, is, so I know that that is against T's and C's of most review platforms. Mm-hmm. Is that the same for Amazon? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just it's just black hat stuff, to be honest. Yeah, um, you're, not, you're not supposed to gateway. Um, yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, you're not supposed to get where you're right, and it's not really setting you up for sustainable success um, because you're going to get screwed eventually if you just genuinely have a two star product. Um, it's yeah. going to come back to bite you. I'd be instead of focusing all your energy about how to get your reviews to four when it's actually a two, I'd be focusing on just creating a better product. Yeah, and um, and that's that's the most likely case with something you're buying on Amazon, I suppose. If it, if it if people are rating it as two star, it's generally because the product just isn't good enough. Um, yeah. Whereas I think if you're selling through your own website, there can be some other factors which which account for a negative review. Um, yeah, there should be around stuff you don't get critiqued on. So if they if they obviously if the review comes in, it says you know it was late. Amazon kind of discredit that review, essentially. They go, like, this isn't your fault. So they've left you a one-star review because it's late. Amazon automatically usually picks up on that and and will remove it so it won't go towards your ratings um, because it's not a review of the product. It's a review of the service, which is Amazon's responsibility if it's fulfilled by them. Yeah, I I have noticed that in the past. Um, Probably not so much recently. But, yeah, in the past, you you look at the one-star reviews – because something I would do immediately when I look at products, and I think a lot of people do it, I filter for uh, normally two-star reviews and two- and three-star just to see what, what those people are saying. Because if they're giving two or three, it, it generally feels like it's going to be an actual review of, review of the product, and it'll explain what's wrong with it. Whereas one-star, it was I definitely found that at a certain point, a lot of the one-star reviews weren't that relevant because they tended to be things like, Oh, it turned up late, or mm-hmm. the, the packaging was damaged. Or it can be like fake that. as well. Sorry, it can be fake as well. You know, there's a lot yeah. of filthy tactics going on out there where 
Um, and, and fortunately, it can be a lot of Chinese sellers who are accused of it, where they're coming in and they're being super aggressive, which means they're buying competing products and then looking to aggressively give them negative reviews and then upvote those negative reviews as well in order to mm. make them seem more valuable than what they are. So yeah. there's networks out there for it. I mean, it's pure filth, don't get me wrong, but it yeah. does happen. So it's good to be aware of what is going on out there so you can react if you start to see these things. Yeah. Um, I mean, is Amazon uh, responsive to to merchants or having issues? You know, if, if you said to them, look, I think we're getting spammed with uh, with negative reviews, does, does Amazon work, work with brands on that or...? It's it's not easy. I mean, I touch wood haven't had it with any of the brands I've worked with, so I've never seen it firsthand. But I do know it is not easy. Usually, Amazon obviously can pick up information from the buyers leaving these reviews, and if they see that a buying count is continuously buying aggressively and then um, leaving negative review very quickly, they can pick up on that. Um, and look into that account. So there's each buying account obviously has a score as well. It's not just the sellers who have a score. So again, when people used to do these deep discounts, like 90% off, um, certain customers who always used to just buy 90% off, they wouldn't have the same weighting with their purchase as a normal customer making a purchase who bought lots of things at full price because they knew that that customer was regularly influenced by heavy discounts and they weren't necessarily buying the product that was most relevant to a search term. So Amazon have picked up on that as well. Yeah. Okay. It's good Good to know. Um, but I suppose that's what you'd expect by, by such a big company now. Yeah, exactly, mate. Uh, cool. I uh, appreciate we're, we're a bit short on time now. Is there anything else you wanted to add on Amazon? I guess, yeah. Uh, one of the tips. key things, one of the key things I my preach is is a mountain strategy of sort and you know it's something we learned a little bit at amazon from observing some large sellers and that was essentially there's there's three pillars you want to be nailing in order first and foremost you kind of have the the base of this pyramid i'd call it which is your operational base a lot of that is around your fulfillment and staying in stock essentially um, and then looking at things like your unboxing experience, that needs to come into your operations. Once you've nailed that, on top of that then comes your branding and looking at all of your touch points. So your creatives on the listing, your copy on the listing, how your whole listing works is brilliant point, how your advertising creatives look, um, what your branding is like um, across um, your, your delivery experience as well. That brand piece is huge because it largely focuses on that conversion piece. Then the third step comes the advertising and driving traffic and utilizing Amazon advertising for that. Now, the reason we we don't really ascend to another level until we've completed the level that you're on is because otherwise the system breaks. But there's no point of having the best advertising experts in the world work on your account and spend 10 grand a month if you can't fulfill orders and you go out of stock quickly or if you haven't got a listing that converts. It's the equivalent of having a big hype for a new supermarket launch and telling every single person on the street to come in and paying them a pound every time they come in with a coupon. And then when they come in, the floors are dirty, everything's got dust on the shelves, the boxes are ripped open. You want to be able to convert those customers that you're sending in, so you work on that content piece second. And you do it second because... Even if you've got the best listing in the world that converts and loads of traffic, if you can't fulfill and stay in stock, none of it matters. So it's always operations, brand, and then traffic. And that is the most simple rule of thumb to think about Amazon that I've yet to come across. Okay. I suppose that makes sense, really. You've got to be able to fulfill. Um, and on your own website, you can obviously just mark it out of stock or put... Um, you know, uh, ask people to to sign up for notifications when things get restocked. But I suppose you can't really do the same on Amazon. It, I imagine if you're if you're out of stock, Amazon just basically hides you from the. They penalise you as well. So let's say you work really hard over a year long period to get to sales rank ten on the first page, and you're buzzing about this because your organic sales are now through the roof. Your advertising costs has gone down. Everyone's happy. 
if you then can't manage that inventory and you go out of stock for, say, a week, it can then take you four, five, six weeks to recover that position. So then it's four, five weeks plus the week you're out of stock completely of lost sales completely or much lower sales than what you were experiencing before. And you then need to obviously work hard on your advertising to get to back to that position as well. So you're spending more money to achieve that. So staying in stock is a huge one right now, particularly during the last year with COVID where inventory restrictions were in place. Um, it can't be overlooked and you simply won't build sustainable success on Amazon with a shitty operational setup. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's good advice. Um, and yeah, what you were saying about branding is really important as well. Um, I've been running some surveys with clients and uh, one of the questions we're asking is um, what is it, what, what is important to you about the website that you're buying from? Um, so not not talking about the products for these ones, just literally, what do you like to see about the website? And so many people are just saying uh, general comments around trust. Um, mm. So some say reviews, some say trust. Um, we've definitely had a few which have stated that uh, the website needs to look professional and trustworthy. So I think if you if you put that time and effort into your your branding and your and the graphics and everything that you use and your and your product images. Um, I would expect that to have uh, quite a decent impact on people as well. A hundred percent, mate. I, like it's, it's part of the reason we created the Amazon creatives. Like all we're doing is just pulling the most inspirational Amazon content we can find for the top brands and go right here is what the biggest players and the most successful players are doing. Here's what you should be learning from them because that content on Amazon is huge. So you're driving traffic. You can work hard to do that unless you can convert them it's a complete waste of time, right? I don't need to explain that to you. So yeah, the, the creators are a big one now and it's really allowing you to differentiate. And unfortunately, you know, there's still so much shit content on Amazon. Lots of people are failing. There's still bad storefronts, bad A+, bad main images galore. Um, so it does present somewhat of an opportunity still. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I know, I know if I look at a product and the images aren't that clear, if they're not, not that high quality, it it makes me question the legitimacy of that of that product, um, especially as I've I've come across so many products where um, you look through the reviews and and you see a bunch of reviews for a different product because that product yeah. listing's been changed. So if you get yeah. those two combined, it's a red flag. But no, not absolutely no way. I'm buying from this. Um, yeah. Um, so just to just quickly before we finish. Um, do you have any pet peeves when it comes to marketing, uh, or, or maybe uh, maybe to do with Amazon selling? Pet peeves with Amazon selling. Um, I don't like Amazon on Amazon too much. Uh, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of how they go about creating their own products. So that, that's that's one pet peeve. But I could natter about that for a, a very long time, and it does feature <laughs> yeah. in my podcast a lot. Um, but I feel it's yeah, not necessarily an equal playing field on Amazon create their own brand in your niche and perhaps have used your data um, to, to then go ahead and create a rival brand, knowing that they can drive the price down to the bottom. They've done it before with many other situations. Yeah. That annoys me. Um, Chinese sellers and Amazon's encouragement of them annoys me a little bit as well because they're not necessarily creating the best experience um and yeah they're they're putting some small local shops out of business and not always providing better products or better service um so that's another pet peeve but other than that i can't think of anything else off the top of my head yeah i suppose i'm guessing the reason amazon kind of tolerates them is because they drive a lot of sales um, because they're yeah. aggressive, um, they they do just drive huge volume, which is good for Amazon. And, and then they just and they bring more competitive pricing, which obviously Amazon want. They want low prices and selection, but it's it's not always high quality. Is it good for the environment? Not necessarily. Is it a better customer experience long term when 
um, you're dealing with just Chinese manufacturers, not necessarily. Um, does it put lots of small businesses out of business if you drive all your traffic just to one very large Chinese seller instead of 10 or 20 small to medium sized ones? That's kind of where my kind of grit is with them at times. But I can yeah. see why Amazon do it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, this has been really, really awesome. Uh, really interesting to hear about Amazon. It's it's not a platform I've actually um, I've got any experience with. So so that was really, really interesting, really useful. Um, if people want to find out more, um, what's the best way of getting in touch? Uh, I think you mentioned you've got a, is it a Facebook group? Yeah, the best one's probably georges.blog. I've just consolidated everything on there now. So anything you need from me, all my content, all my emails, all my podcasts, LinkedIn can all be found on georges.blog. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll make sure there's a, a link to that in the show notes. Champion, Will. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. No worries, pal. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Amazon provides a fantastic opportunity for your brand. You've just got to understand it and build it into your marketing mix and the customer journey. You know, as George mentioned, the convenience of Amazon is incredible for a customer, but it's also a really strong trust point for them as well. They can quickly check the Amazon listing for your products for reviews to see if you're genuine. It's kind of almost like someone checking Trustpilot, except they obviously can also buy at the same time. The unboxing experience is where you've got a great opportunity to engage the customer and capture data, though. While unboxing is important for any business, of course, with Amazon, you're also looking to engage that customer for a first time as the brand. So give them that reason to scan a QR code, visit your website and exchange a bit of data for something of value in return. If you'd like to learn more about Sediment Amazon, reach out to George on LinkedIn or head over to georges.blog. Any other podcast questions, feedback, guest requests, send them over to will at customerswhoclick.com or tweet me at Will Lawrenson. Next up, I've got Chase Climber joining me and we're going to be talking about his brand scaling framework. But until then, keep those customers clicking.